Freedom. A two-syllable word with a thousand meanings. Which matters more, my freedom to swing my fist, or my freedom to punch you in the face? Scholars remain divided. But there's one type of freedom that's the queen of freedom, yea, the robust trunk and turgid root of the great tree of liberty itself, and that is our most fundamental freedom. The freedom, freedom of speech. speech. Unfortunately, that freedom is now under attack by leftists. I mean, just look at all these hot takes. The left is killing free speech. The left is silencing free speech. The left turned against free speech. The left wants to suppress free speech. The left is assaulting free speech. The left is stifling free speech. The left is silencing free speech. Leftist terrorists are at war with free speech gooby. Fuck! This sounds pretty bad. Luckily, one hero has emerged to champion freedom once again, and that man is no less than YouTube's own Dave Rubin, a man who loves freedom more than life itself, a man who may disapprove of what you say, but will defend to the death your right to appear on his program and spout racist bullshit without interruption or objection, a man who's prepared to water the tree of liberty with his own tears. Are you Check tearing out. up? <laughs> you did something! No, it's, uh, there's a, there's, the lights are getting me. Uh. Was it the lights, Dave? Are you sure it wasn't? Freedom? <laughs> so here's the thing. I know and have known a lot of people who are educated, sincere, and sympathetic to Ruben's point of view, so I think it's worth engaging. And Dave, he's not a Nazi, so you know what, Dave? Pull up a seat. Let's talk. Oh, hold on. I'll make you a drink. Fire! 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 Now you've heard it. Not shouted in a crowded theatre, admittedly. As I realise, I seem now to have shouted it in the Hogwarts dining room. <laughs> ten points to Gryffindor, my friends! Ten points indeed! Jesus, I can already feel myself being infected by Hitchens' pompous oratorical style. I'm tempted to call him oh, the fatuous overpraised Christopher Hitchens. If I keep that up, I'll be quoting Philip Lorcan at you by the end of the video. But you know, Dave, it's fitting that I had an acid flashback and hallucinated Christopher Hitchens just then, because Hitchens is, in a sense, the steel man of your position, the ultimate champion of free speech. I mean, he's every liberal white boy's favorite, the man who Bill Maher practically tears up over while besmirching his memory comparing him to Milo Yiannopoulos. I mean, you, you remind me of like a of a, of a young, gay, alive Christopher Hitchens. Ugh. The point is, if I choose Hitchens as the representative of my opponent's position on free speech, surely no one can accuse me of strawmanning. So tell me, Acid Hitchens, what does free speech mean to you? So I'll, I'll be very daring and summarize all three of these great gentlemen of the great tradition of especially English liberty um, in one go. What they say is, it's not just the right of the person who speaks to be heard. It is the right of everyone in the audience to listen and to hear. And every time you silence somebody, you make yourself a prisoner of your own action because you deny yourself the right to hear something. So free speech isn't just protection against laws regulating expression. It's also the right of any speaker to a platform and the right of an audience to hear. But does that really apply to everyone? Like, what about a Holocaust denier? So that person doesn't just have a right to speak. That person's right to speak must be given extra protection because what he has to say must have taken him some effort to come up with, might be, might contain a grain of historical truth, um, might in any case give people to think about why do they know what they already think they know. How do I know that I know this except that I've always been taught this and never heard anything else? So not only does a Holocaust denier have a right to speak, but, in this view, because what they say is marginal, we actually have a duty to provide special protections to make sure that what they have to say is heard. This is a huge, all-inclusive, and very nuanced notion of free speech. And Hitchens isn't making it up. It comes from John Stuart Mill, one of history's great social justice warriors. According to this view, the right to free speech goes way beyond anything guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. It takes into consideration not just legal restrictions, but also the social pressures that can silence nonconformists in marginal viewpoints in subtle ways. And you know, Dave, I like that you and Hitchens have this very advanced conception of free speech. The idea that we should protect and perhaps even amplify minority viewpoints is one that I share. So great, we actually start from a point of philosophical agreement. 
Where we disagree is in the application, the main point of contention being which speakers are truly marginalized and in need of special protection. And I think the best way to flesh out that disagreement is to consider the accusations that the left has it out for free speech. In my experience, the big pieces of evidence usually brought out against the social justice warrior left are prohibitions against hate speech, trigger warnings, safe spaces, and deplatforming. In this video, I'll cover hate speech, and the rest of it, well, we'll get to that soon, Dave. We'll get to that real soon. Tell me, Lao Shi, what is the meaning of freedom? Objection 1. Hate speech prohibitions. Unlike the accusations regarding trigger warnings and safe spaces, the suggestion that the prohibition of hate speech violates the right to free speech is at least not completely frivolous. I think this is worth taking seriously. Now, free speech prohibitions exist at three levels. At the highest level, there are legal prohibitions, such as the prohibitions against displaying Nazi imagery, which have allowed Nazis to get my anti-Nazi videos banned in much of Europe. Speaking as a freedom-loving American, I find these laws clearly in violation of what the right to free speech protects. I mean, what? The Fuhrer is gonna make it illegal to display a swastika now? What is this, Nazi Germany?! At the middle level, there's institutional prohibitions, such as those that prohibit hate speech in particular settings, such as universities or the workplace. These, I think, are quite a good idea, and I'll explain why in a moment. At the bottom level, there are social restrictions. For instance, there's a lot of social pressure in certain communities not to be racist, sexist, homophobic, and so on. And although not formal rules, these norms can have a silencing effect and place a de facto limitation on the things people are willing to say. For instance, conservatives and classical liberals are constantly complaining to me about how the words transphobe, racist, Islamophobe, and so on are being used to silence them. And in a sense, they're kind of right. I mean, people are saying those things to you because they want you to stop saying what you're saying. But of course, this is pretty microscopic as far as restrictions on free speech go. So I guess you might say it's a sort of free speech microaggression, right? And that is what it is. It's a subtle, indirect way of trying to get you not to say a certain thing. So great, I want to congratulate conservatives on independently discovering the idea of microaggressions. But, if you're willing to grant that words like Islamophobia can have a silencing effect, you should also be willing to grant that small acts of racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on can likewise suppress the speech of marginalized people. For instance, I constantly hear from women, trans, and gender non-conforming people that they've thought of making YouTube videos, but they just don't want to deal with the hate, the trolls, the constant misogyny and attacks on gender identity, the public shaming and genderqueer and feminist cringe compilations, and so they just avoid speaking up on YouTube altogether. So in a sense, these people are being silenced by the misogynistic and transphobic atmosphere, in the same way that your average YouTube shitlord would probably feel pretty alone and silenced in a gender studies class with 19 women complaining about sexist men. Now, when I bring this up with classical liberals, they uniformly respond, If you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. The internet's just like that. Why can't you just deal with it? To which I respond, Why can't you just deal with being called a racist on college campuses? Academia's just like that. And whatever you say to that, there's the answer to your question. So if you adopt a sophisticated view of free speech, you have to contend with the following contradictory situation. There are many instances where you have to choose between suppressing one person's speech or another's. The fact is, there is no true neutral when it comes to free speech. It's literally impossible to protect everyone's speech equally because some forms of speech tend to dampen other forms of speech. So there comes a point where you have to choose whose side you're on. In this case, do you want to defend the speech of misogynists or the speech of women? Racists or people of color? homophobes and transphobes, or queer people. And I'm not talking about passing laws here, I'm talking about establishing norms of discourse. And what I notice about you, Dave, and about much of your audience, is you only ever seem to stand up for the right of people not to be silenced by slurs like racist and transphobe. And in fact, you present the topic like it's the most important political issue in the world right now. But on the subject of how bigoted attitudes and speech may silence women, people of color, queer people, and other marginalized groups, you seem to have absolutely nothing to say. There's endless catastrophizing from classical liberals on YouTube and elsewhere about how policies prohibiting transphobia in the workplace, including intentional misgendering, are a terrible limitation on the freedom of speech of transphobes. But these same people give no concern whatsoever to the way in which a hostile environment where, for instance, a trans employee's gender identity is constantly disparaged and disregarded might itself have a silencing effect if it doesn't pressure trans people out of the workforce altogether. And I can't help but look at this and conclude that you've taken a side in an ideological battle, while pretending all the way that you're simply defending the supposedly 
the neutral value of free speech. Well, don't think we don't notice which instances of speech you choose to defend. And this doesn't just apply to Dave Rubin either. Let's see what Hitchens, so passionate in his defense of the Holocaust denier's right to a platform, has to say about protecting the speech of women, queer people, and people of color. Because we've had invocations of a rather driveling and sickly kind tonight of our sympathy. What about the poor fags? What about the poor Jews, the wretched women who can't take the abuse? and the slaves and their descendants and the, and the tribes who didn't make it and were told that their land was forfeit. So the women, the fags, the slaves and their descendants, and the tribes who didn't make it should just take the abuse while the Holocaust denier deserves special protections. Like I said, don't think we don't notice whose speech you rush to defend and who you tell to take the abuse and get over it. Why does everyone love Hitchens so much? I mean, we've got people in the comments saying they want to memorize his speech and that they cried during his speech because of freedom. I mean, every American liberal with a weakness for a slick turn of phrase and an oaky public school accent is susceptible. I certainly had a boner for the man for years, and part of me still does. But there's something self-satisfying about it, isn't there? I, the intellectual kin of Socrates, appreciate the true value of free speech in accordance with the great English tradition of liberty, unlike these wretched, whiny women, blacks, and Muslims. Fuck that sh Tell me, Lao Shu, what is permitted? And what? Forbidden. The truth is that there are always explicit or implicit limitations on the kind of speech that's acceptable. And there are major restrictions that no one complains about, not even Dave Rubin. For instance, there's a whole lot of stuff that you aren't allowed to say or do in a YouTube video. If there weren't, there would be a whole lot more full penetration on this channel, I can tell you that. Just multiple camera angles of me being ruthlessly pegged by a giant woman in a lizard mask. And sure, maybe that's not what Milton had in mind when he wrote the Areopagitica, but do you believe in freedom or not, Dave? And okay, I guess obscenity and hate speech are maybe not equivalent examples. Granted, but even the staunchest defenders of free speech all seem to have instances where they're willing to make exceptions. For instance, Hitchens claims at the beginning of his free speech lecture that he's willing to tolerate any interruption, no matter how abusive. I exempt myself from the speaker's kind offer of protection that was uh, so generously proffered at the opening of this evening. Anyone who wants to say anything abusive about or to me is quite free to do so. And we've heard his defense of platforming Holocaust deniers, but is he willing to give 9-11 truthers the same courtesy? Let's take a look. Go away. Go away. We don't want fascist crackpots taking up our meeting. Thank you. Go away. Go away. Different panel. Fascist crackpot. Different. Fascist crackpot. Different we're here. Panel. We're not here to talk to you. Throw him out. Sir. Throw him out. Sir. Sir. Security. Security, please. So he calls them fascist crackpots and has them removed by security. And in the comments, the fanboys are celebrating the ownage. But all he did is deplatform them, which, fair enough, I mean, I would do the same. But he's doing exactly what I say we should do with people like Richard Spencer, and then people accuse me of being against freedom of speech. The point is, no one is perfectly consistent when it comes to protecting the speech of people they disagree with. And in fact, it's impossible to be perfectly consistent because, as I've argued, some forms of speech tend to suppress other forms of speech. But I think you can learn a lot about a person's politics, by which speech they choose to defend, and which speech they choose to shut down. So when I see people defending Richard Spencer, and acting like the Declaration of Human Rights has gone up in flames because of campus or workplace hate speech prohibitions, while saying absolutely nothing about the way hate speech itself can be silencing, I don't see neutral defenders of free speech. I see people who have taken a side. And it's not the right side. As Philip Larkin once said, Well, are you going to answer the phone? Special thanks to James Rands, who's been very unjustly excluded from the credits until now. And, for the last time reading the entire roster aloud, 
at least until the failure sets in and I have fewer patrons again, a very special thanks indeed to Aaron Ho, Aislinn, Amy August, Alejandro Herrera, Alexis Goldusky, and huge pair of goggly eyes and a flaccid penis, 2006 video game, Angelina Beast Mode, Annoyance, Ariel Elliott, Arvid Horned, Art Souls, Botseps, Brainflower, Carter Kalchik, Cap'n Bubs, Chanticleer, Chris Trastero, Computer Pupper, Connor Morris, Crispin Alexander Steikert, Daniel Stewart, David Adrian Matadal, David the Benevolent Malevolence, David the Benevolent Malevolence, you bastard, you bastard with your hard to pronounce name, Elias Jackson, Elton, Eris, Ewan, Felipe Villasenor, Feral Kimchi, Fernacular, Flicky, Forer, Garrett Lassie, Get Dunked On, Heronine Addict, Heterodox, J. Michael Comfort, Jason Walter, Jennifer German, Jessica Hazard White, Joel Casas, Jonas Arentorp, Jonathan Messino, Kat Stas, Christer Svonland, Mallory Ellen, Margaret Pless, Manfred Ghost Puncher, Max, Michael C. Johnson, Mickey Rao, Mitchell Reedman, Nick Wolf, Neil Tax, Stealer of Souls, No No No, Olivia Mello, Percy Steamboat, Philo, Pofo, Problematic White Bitch, Rational Disconnect, Raymond Heinrich, Bree Mansell, Rob Hotz, Robert Phillips, Roman Olyashev, Romy Koya, Sarek of Vulcan, Sean Wallace, Space Kitty, Step Back, Sophie C, Thea Williams, Theodore Warner, The Coffee Cup, Tom Martell, Top Pupperanian, Unknown Email, Vera, Vladlina Kostescu, Voron, Wesley Loving, your friendly neighborhood anarchist, and the rest of you glorious contrarians. God bless you all. God bless America. If you want to join this weird cult, then link to my Patreon in the description.